and children can be dismissed. This morning's passage is Mark chapter 14, 26 to 52. It's on page 851. Mark 14, 26 to 52. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass for him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you might not ent enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve. And he said, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up and at once said, Rabbi. And he kissed him and they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out against as a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And the young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mira, for reading. Uh, good morning to each of you. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, Robin has already mentioned the Roscoe Village Open Forum this coming Thursday. I'd really love to, to see you there, especially if you've never been to one of our open forums before. Um, anxiety is one of those, uh, something that touches a lot of people very close to me in really powerful ways. And I've noticed that I haven't done a lot of pastoral counseling for people who are addicted to meth, uh, but I have done a lot of counseling for people who are anxious. And there have been people in my life who have been counselors to me um, when I've been anxious. So I hope to see you this Thursday. What do you do with your failure? That's the question that this passage is inviting, is ask, is inviting us to ask, that, that you have the best intentions to do the right thing, to do the good thing, but you don't. You fail. Your, your best intentions, your strongest resolve only sets you up for disappointment in yourself. So what do you do with your failure? In 1979, um, outside Indianapolis, Dr. Donald Klein opened up a fertility clinic. And this was in the early days of fertility treatment. Uh, sperm banks were shrouded in, mist in secrecy, and the, the doctor would find the donor, but you wouldn't have a clue uh, who those donors were or how the doctor found them. And Klein treated thousands of couples, and a few years ago, DNA testing 
to trace your ancestry became popular, and maybe you've done, you've, some of you have done that kind of thing. And as all these people in Indy are, we're, we're, are doing these DNA tests on themselves to see where their ancestors came from, complete strangers started discovering that they were half brothers and sisters. They had all been conceived through their parents' fertility treatment at Donald Klein's clinic. And it turns out that Donald Klein was their biological father. He was the donor. The latest count is that he fathered 48 children, and there are surely more out there. And now all those children have grown up, and they've, they've learned that what they've always thought of themselves, of who they are, is a lie. And families feel betrayed by Klein. I mean, your doctor, the person that you should, who sh you should trust more than just about anyone. And hundreds of people, because of, of one doctor's it's kind of sick God complex, feel violated and betrayed in the most intimate ways. And many of those children also feel betrayed by their parents who, who kept the details of their conception secret their whole lives. Parents who knew all along that dad wasn't their biological father, but they never talked about it. It's not just a sick doctor, it's deceptive parents, and the children feel betrayed. We've all been betrayed by people we love and trust. We've all been hurt and disappointed by those who are closest to us. You know what it is like for people not to be there for you when you most need them. But what Mark does in this scene is reverse the roles, where Jesus is the victim of other people's failures and betrayal and abandonment, and where the guilty is every single one of his followers. And what he's doing is inviting us to put ourselves in their shoes and to make us reckon with our own failures, our own shortcomings, our own betrayals. So what do you do with your failure? That's the question God wants you to wrestle with this morning. What, what do you do with your failure? Let's pray as we come to God's word and, and reckon with who we are and who God is for us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Bible isn't some sanitized, sweetened, chicken soup for the soul kind of pep talk. But it's honest, it's blunt, it doesn't hide from us the kinds of people we can be. It doesn't hide real suffering from us. It doesn't hide what the Lord Jesus had to go through to lift us up from our failures. Help us to listen to you, we pray, and by, by listening, to be strengthened in our walk with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what do you do with your failure? You notice in the, the scripture reading that there's a lot of action happening. There's a lot of plot. And it's a lot of plot about Jesus' disciples completely blowing it. It, it starts with Jesus saying that they're all going, that's what's going to happen. They're all going to fall away. And it ends with a streaker. Uh, a lot going on and none of it very flattering for those people who follow Jesus. And to capture this failure, to, to, uh, or this series of failures, I want to, to use three words, uh, three verbs that peg, uh, as pegs to hang our time on. Falling, sleeping, and fleeing. That's what's happening here. Falling, sleeping, and fleeing. So first of all, falling. Let's look together at our passage again, starting in verse 26. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written... I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, to give us some context for what's going on here, Jesus and his disciples have just celebrated the Passover meal in the city, and Jesus has instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper. So they close that time together with a hymn, and they leave the city, and they go to the Mount of Olives, which is just right outside the city. And that's when Jesus says, you're all going to fall away. That's the first word falling. You're all going to fall away. The word for fall here in Mark's original means to stumble or, or trip. You're all going to stumble and fall. Remember, he's just said during their Passover meal that one of them is going to betray him. And maybe, you know, they're, they're doing the math and feeling pretty good about the odds that they're one of the 11 non-betrayers rather than the one betrayer. This is how the math works out. But here he's saying that they're all going to fall away, 12 out of 12 of, 12 of them, all of them. And it's the, the totality of it, the 100% the failure rate that invites us into the story. That lets us say, yeah, that's, 
That's me too. I'm one of the guys who falls away. Now, if you don't think that's you, if, if you're the all-star Christian who never blows it, you, you can go ahead and tune out everything else I'm going to say. You can, you can play Candy Crush on your phone. Just keep the, the volume down so you don't bother the rest of us. Uh, but you're all going to fall away, Jesus tells his disciples. And then he quotes from the Old Testament book of Zechariah. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Uh, the, the passage that Jesus quotes is about God's shepherd, the Messiah, being cut down. And when he's cut down, all the sheep who's following him run away. They, these people flee. But there's one guy here who thinks he can get away with playing Candy Crush. Peter. So confident that he's going to be just fine. Verse 29. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Now, think about how doubly confident Peter is. He's really confident in that he's not going to fall away, but he's also pretty confident that everyone else is going to fall away. Hey, sure, these, you know, these clowns over here are going to crash and burn, but, but not me. I'm, I'm pretty sure on Survivor or The Bachelorette or whatever, Peter's the guy who gets kicked off the island or gets kicked out of the clubhouse pretty quickly. Uh, he's just insufferable. But Jesus says to him, the height of your arrogance and your confidence is going to match the spectacle of your fall. Peter, you are going to fall very hard and very quickly. Look at that in verse 30. Jesus said to, them, to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. In other words, you're not just going to fall away. You're going to deny me three times. On three separate occasions, you're going to publicly disavow having anything to do with me. And you're going to do that tonight. Before morning comes, before Foghorn Leghorn wakes up, you're going to fall hard. Now, Robin's going to talk about that next week in a sermon when Peter actually denies Jesus. But, but look how Peter's still so confident that he's going to be the hero. Verse 31. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Think about your own resolutions. Uh, and I'm not talking about you know, your New Year's resolutions, which statistically speaking, we've all uh, abandoned and forgotten about months ago. Uh, I'm not talking about your, your body weight goals or your reading goals or, your, or how much money you want to save. I'm talking about your resolutions uh, where you want to change who you are where you want to be a better person, a new person, where you've seen your past failings and you commit to yourself that I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to get drunk again. I'm not going to sleep with that person again. I'm not going to look at pornography again. I'm not going to get overwhelmed by stress again. I'm not going to yell at my family again. I'm not going to do that thing again. And then it happens again. So then you get really serious and you write about it in a journal and you, you bring an accountability partner into it to, 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 into your confidence to, to help you in your commitment. And maybe you even threaten yourself with some kind of reward and punishment system. You know, if I, if I don't spend money on this bad thing here, then I'll, I'll treat myself to a movie, or something like that. You get really, really serious. And then you fail again. We can be exactly like Peter, really overconfident in our own strength to do the right thing. You will all fall away, Jesus says to his closest friends. As soon as it gets hard, you're going to stumble and fall. Falling. But from falling to sleeping. In verses 32 through 42, the heart of our passage, the word that best describes the disciples' failure is sleeping. Look, let's look at that in verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. It's probably some olive orchard or olive grove. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Last night, my family was with some folks from the broader HCC family down on the south side and at a goodbye party for some of our, our closest friends here in Chicago who are moving off to Michigan. And there was a party to send them off. And of course, there was a time for speeches uh, where we got to tell them what they meant to us and they, they told us what we meant to them. And one theme in those speeches was that was what those friendships meant during moments of severe suffering. The suffering of a miscarriage for one family and a stillborn child for another. And they were with each other when these terrible things happened. And that's why, Peter's, that's why Jesus has brought Peter, James, and John a little farther into the orchard. He wants, to be, he wants his three closest friends to be near him because he's distressed and troubled. 
Mark says. And look how the, the emotional language keeps ratcheting up. Verse 34. He said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. If you've ever doubted that Jesus is a real human being, look no further than in these words. This is a human being whose soul is in pieces. Some people argue today that the New Testament, the, the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus are an embellishment of the real person Jesus. So the, the, the argument goes that, that the real Jesus was, you know, it, some kind of impressive guy. He was really influential. He, was, he gathered a following. Uh, it, probably the kind of guy who, who stirred the pot and gathered a following there. And he really hit a nerve for people. But then after he died, legends grew up around him. And, and stories were made up about his miracles, about feeding the 5,000, even being raised from the dead. So what we read in the Gospels, so the argument goes, is far removed from the real historical person. But the problem with that, or one of the problems with that, is that that kind of interpretation doesn't really make sense of passages like this. If you're going to make up stories to make your founding hero look good, you don't make up stories about his emotional devastation. In fact, in those documents that were clearly written a lot later after Jesus and, or his followers, which books which didn't make it into the Bible, uh, Jesus doesn't look all that human. Uh, he looks like Dr. Manhattan, the, the blue guy from The Watchmen, the, the graphic novel, this, this being of unlimited power who kind of hovers over the ground but who isn't human anymore. And, and he, does, he doesn't understand people and people don't understand him. That's what you get when you embellish stories. You don't get a man so sorrowful that he needs his friends to be with him. You don't get a man so upset that he asks God for another way. I mean, what a prayer, isn't it? Uh, Abba, Father, that, uh, that's the language of intimacy. Uh, my children never make formal requests of me. They never email me. They never, they never wait for an opportune time when I'm less preoccupied by other things. They just yell for me. Uh, th that's their privilege of being my children. That, that they have access to me which other people don't have. And Jesus is yelling for his Father. Abba, Father. And in his prayer, he affirms two things about his Father, God. And these are two things for you to hold on to in your own prayers. That God can do anything, and that God wills certain things. He decides certain things. And it's not for us to alter his will, but to accept it. That's what Jesus does. Now, plenty of times, we don't know what his will is, right? So we pray for his will to be done, and we, which we hope might look a certain way. But Jesus shows us what it looks like to face the most terrible thing you could possibly face, not as a robot, but as a human being. And face that thing and not run away and not lash out at God in resentment. Remove this cup from me. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's another way, but not what I will, but what you will. That's his prayer. But while he's praying, what are his friends doing? They're sleeping. Verse 37. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Usually the Bible talks about sleep as a good thing. I, I know it's a good thing, because when I, I can be a, a terrible person to be around when I don't, I don't get enough of it. it. It's a good thing because rest is a gift. We, we don't have to be always just surviving. We can be, be resting. But here... To sleep isn't to trust and rest. To sleep is not to watch. The temptation that Jesus is warning about isn't the temptation to sleep some more, but it's the temptation to do what Peter has said he's not going to do, to fall away when things get hard. But the spirit is willing but, and the flesh is weak. One, one scholar says that this probably doesn't just mean that, that your inner life is strong but your body is weak, but that... Your highest human aspirations are really noble and well-intentioned, but your lower desires, your, your baser weaknesses, make you pursue comfort and self-interest. Pray that that doesn't happen. But Peter doesn't pray 
Uh, two more times, there's this, this pattern of, of Jesus praying and his, his friend sleeping again. So verse 39, and again, he, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to, to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So Jesus prays, they sleep. Jesus prays, they sleep. Jesus prays, they sleep. And then it's too late. The end comes. So what's the lesson here? Well, think about what you do when you face something really, really difficult. Something terrible. What do you do? A lot of us fall into one of the, the fight or flight response categories. So this, this, this terrible thing happens, so, or maybe it's going to happen, so I escape. I, I escape into a TV show, I escape in, or a really good book, or I escape into a bottle or, a, or the endless Instagram feed, uh, and I, I shut myself off in the real world and from other people. Uh, that, that's, that's the flight response. Other people are, are fighters, but not in a, in a good, courageous way, in a I can trust in myself to, to get out of this problem kind of way. I'm strong enough, I'm smart enough, I'm tough enough, I can fix it. But then you can't fix it. And that's when you unravel. You shut down, you, you lash out, you escape. It's kind of like the disciples. They're not sleeping because they know God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life. They're sleeping because they think they're bigger than whatever it is they're about to face. But they're not bigger. Because they trust themselves, they're going to unravel pretty quickly. Something bigger than you comes your way. What do you do? You can try to escape it. You can try to fight it in your own strength. Or you can do what Jesus does. He prays. He's distressed and troubled, so he prays. He's sorrowful in his soul to the point of death, so he prays. He's about to drink the terrible cup of suffering and abandonment, so he prays. Now, prayer is not the magic spell that makes bad things go away. Uh, prayer, as Jesus shows us here, is a brutally honest conversation with your Father that trusts him no matter what's coming your way. So what do you do when you face things that are bigger than you? What, what do you do when following Jesus gets hard? Don't sleep. Pray. Falling, sleeping, and then fleeing. Now, as readers of Mark, we know that Judas has agreed to betray Jesus, to sell out Jesus. And here it comes, verse 43. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd of swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. Uh, we're obviously in the, the Mediterranean world here in the passage. Uh, uh, people kiss each other as a, as a normal greeting. So this kiss would not have looked suspicious. And so Judas betrays his friend with that kiss. Verse 45. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him and laid hands on him and seized him. One of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the, the servant of the, of the high priest and cut off his ear. And he said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you didn't seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And here's the clincher for the whole passage, verse 50. And they all left him and fled. One scholar says that these few words say that all there is to be said. They flee. All of them, even Peter. And then in a scene that only Mark records, there's this bit about the naked guy at the very end. Look at that in verse 51. And a young man followed him with nothing but a, a linen cloth, a cloth about, his, about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, who is this guy and what's going on here? Well, we have no idea who he is. Not one of the 12 disciples, presumably. He's not dressed in layers. We, we know that. But for the moment, he's the best hope for someone who, who bucks the trend. He hasn't fled. He hasn't deserted. He's following Jesus and the arresting party. But then someone grabs him. His cloth comes off in someone's hand. And he's exposed. And he runs away. 
All of Jesus' his disciples, all of his followers, all of his friends, symbolized in this one scene of a man running away in shame. Take your best intentions, your most optimistic take on human possibility of, of, of course I'll follow you, Jesus. Of course I'll do the right thing. Of course I won't do the wrong thing. Now, take that line of thinking, which is what the disciples thought, and you end up with a naked man running away Hiding in the dark is complete, total, shameful failure. So what do you do with failure? They're all going to fall away. They fell asleep. They fled. What do you do with that kind of failure? This is such a a bleak expose of the human heart, isn't it? And if we're honest with ourselves, we see ourselves in the story, except for the people playing Candy Crush. But but it probably doesn't take a lot of imagination to say, yeah, I've fallen, I've stumbled, I've fallen asleep, I've run away and hid. I failed. So what do you do with your failure? Do you just leave it at that? Well, there's one more verb here that I want to show you. And it's rise. Get up and follow the risen Lord Jesus. Verse 28, which we kind of glanced over earlier, actually gives a kernel of hope that shows that all of this failure failure here isn't the last word. Look at that again. You're all going to fall away. The sheep are going to be scattered. But verse 28 again, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Jerusalem was where Jesus was rejected, but Galilee was where his ministry was most vibrant. It's where they first followed him. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're going to fail, and I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised up again. So get up and follow me to that place of healing. The shepherd has been raised, so now the sheep aren't scattered anymore. Follow your shepherd. You failed, but your failure has been dealt with. Jesus was abandoned and rejected and killed. And because he did that, those failures have been wiped clean. They're erased from the record. And he's been raised. And so you rise up with him and follow him to that place. And for some of you, you're so burdened and beaten down with your own failures, uh, whether or not you're being fair to yourself, but, but the weight is so heavy on you that you feel like you've disqualified yourself from God's company. So there's no point going to church. There's no point in praying. There's no point in reading your Bible. But Jesus says to you, I have risen. And the days of your self-condemnation are over. Get up and follow me. And this getting up and following Jesus is, is what repentance is. Uh, repentance doesn't mean I feel like a failure, so now I'm going to try really, really hard not to mess up again because I, I don't like feeling dirty like this. That's not repentance. That's trusting yourself and living in fear. Gospel repentance says, yes, I have sinned, I have failed, but my Savior died for me and he calls me in mercy so I can turn from that thing, but not turn to my own good intentions. I can turn to the one who loved me and gave himself for me. His grace was sufficient for me for what I've done in the past. His grace is sufficient for me now in this present moment and his grace will be sufficient for me as he makes me into that new person in the days ahead in my life. So in the sufficiency of his grace, I get up and I follow my risen Savior. That's what you do with your failure. Falling, sleeping, fleeing, but getting back up and following the risen Lord Jesus. Jerry Rood, a professor at Wheaton College, told a story in the graduate chapel once uh, one of the only times when I actually went to chapel in grad school, whatever that says about me, uh, he, was, he was telling a, a story in chapel about, um, in a sermon about giving another sermon at another chapel at All Souls College at Oxford University. Now, if, if Oxford University is one of the most prestigious schools in, uh, universities in the world, uh, All Souls is one of the most prestigious, maybe the most prestigious college at Oxford. So, he preached in chapel, and afterwards, he was invited to stay for dinner in the college. And by tradition, he, he sat at the high table. Think the high table at Hogwarts, except for, for really, really accomplished muggles. So Jerry Root was eating up there with all the All Souls faculty, and it was, it was very formal, and he said that you could cut the pretense with a knife. And at one point, early in the meal, 
someone asked him, why are you a Christian? And he found out later that the point of the question was for him to be the entertainment for the evening, to, for them to, to listen to this yokel talk about his religion. But he answered with his tongue firmly in his cheek to give me an opportunity to practice my holiness. And the questioner laughed. She caught the joke. And Root pressed her a bit on that. He said, you're laughing because you know it's not true. You know that I don't have all this holiness, that I, I need something to do with it. And he asked her, what do you believe in? She said, I believe in humanity. But he said, we've just laughed at my own obvious shortcomings. Uh, what about you? Have people ever hurt you? Yes, of course, he said. And have you ever hurt other people? Yes, of course, he said. So you failed other people, and other people have failed you, and yet you believe in humanity more than anything else? And from that point on, he said that he actually had a, a sincere conversation. But that's what Mark says to us, that, that we are people who fail, that our best efforts end up, get us to like the guy running away naked in shame. But Jesus Christ saw the bitter cup of suffering with 100% clarity. He knew the cost. He desired something easier, but he drank it anyway. And he rose from the dead. He makes all things new. And he calls his people to get up and follow him. Follow him to that place of healing. Follow him in that new faithfulness. That's what you do with your failure. Let's pray together as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. Let's pray. Only Father... We take a moment now and, and take stock of who we are. And we pause now and consider how we've stumbled and fallen and fallen asleep and we've, we should have been praying in the moment of our temptation and how even if it's something that happens in our hearts and no one else can see it, but how we've, we, we, we reckon with how we've, we've left you and fled in fear and shame. And yet your son didn't do any of these things, not because it was easy, but because he had to live the life that we were meant to live. So we praise him for doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We praise him that his resurrection means that our failures will never be the last word in our stories. That all is forgiven and that we stand now not on the basis of our successes, but we stand in Christ. So strengthen us in his grace and power. Show us the beautiful, merciful gift of repentance and faith. Lift us up when we fall so that we would follow you, our risen shepherd. We pray this in his name. Amen.